Thank you to our worship team for your ministry this morning. Thank you to our greeters and ushers and everyone involved in making our service work today. You probably noticed things are a little different this morning. Pastor Lynn Scott and his family are on a much-deserved vacation. They are out camping this week in Wisconsin, and it sounds like they had rain, or were supposed to have rain almost every day. So it's not raining here, but it might be raining there. If they're listening, I hope it's not. <laughs> not saying I want it to rain. I hope it's not raining. Um, this morning, I'm going to be starting a new series and my opportunities to preach. I fill in for Pastor Lynn Scott occasionally, and there's other opportunities I have. Um, recently, we went through Jonah and finished that, so we are going to be starting a new series this morning. And because we're all probably missing Pastor Lynn Scott a little bit, some of you probably know where this is going. You're probably missing his jokes, right? <laughs> See, I have my kids. They're programmed to cheer when I make jokes. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. All right. This morning, we're going to be working in James. We're going to be talking about trials. Now, an interesting thing that's impacted me this morning and has several times in my ministry history is sometimes everything just lines up. You know, I didn't plan the songs for today. I don't normally do that. That's something Pastor Lynn Scott does for the music team, usually three months in advance. Um, he does it by the quarter, and he plans themes for a week. Um, I have started thinking about what I was going to be preaching next, and I settled on James just a while ago before I had realized what we'd be singing. Um, so some of the songs that we've sang this morning are very apropos for what we're going to be going over. That's encouraging. Um, so he is having an impact on the service, Pastor Lynn Scott, and planning good songs for us in ways he didn't know, but you're probably missing his jokes too. So I'll get on with the puns now. Don't worry about it. Um, talking about trials, we're going to be talking about trials we go through, but the title of my sermon is Putting Trials on Trial. Understanding why they're here, what they are, what they do. We're going to be um, kind of investigating them a little bit. So I have a couple courtroom jokes for you. What happened to the banana salesman who was convicted for accidentally injuring his customer? He lost the case, but he won the appeal. Did you hear about the man who was put on trial for being caught on camera at the airport stealing a businessman's bag? It was a briefcase. See, they're bad. I can do bad jokes too. It's not just Pastor Lynn Scott. So in honor of him, there's some bad jokes for you. But the idea of trials in the Bible is kind of a broad one. We're not going to be talking about legal trials here, although I'm sure some of you have probably had jury duty in the past or been involved in one way or another. I'm sure some of our Mayo doctors have had to deal with legal situations in the past just because that's the nature of our, our country. But we're not going to be talking about those today, although we're going to be looking at that kind of in a understanding how this case works sort of thing. But if you were a student of literature, maybe you've read about different trials that people have gone through in the past. If you like reading ancient writing or mythology, you might have read about Heracles or Hercules, as we tend to call him, um, who had 12 labors or sometimes called trials, 12 trials, which he had to undergo to atone for the murder of his family when he was driven mad by the goddess Hera. But we as believers go through very real trials, not talking about, again, legal trials. We're not talking about people bringing us to court necessarily. That could be a trial. We're going to be talking about the various trials that we go through in our lives and what the purpose of them are. And as we see in James 1, they can actually be a blessing. So I would encourage you to turn with me to James chapter 1. If not, I have the words on the screen. We're going to be reading from the ESV. I'm going to read verses 1 through 18, and then we'll look back and see what these verses are teaching. Verse 1 of chapter 1 says, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you have any wisdom... If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. 
But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Let the rich, man, the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises, and it, with his scorching heat, it withers the grass, grass and flower fails, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the truth of the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In this passage, in James 1, we see that we experience trials so the Lord can form us into a completed follower of Christ. Now, the book of James was written sometime before the date of 62 AD. Traditionally accepted author of the book of James is James the Just or James of Jerusalem, the half-brother of Jesus. James previously, as we know, was not a believer in Jesus as Messiah. He just saw him as his half-brother. Um, he doubted his divinity, as we see in John chapter 7. It's, it's told that he, his siblings didn't believe that he was Messiah. But we're told later by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to James after his resurrection, even before he appeared to the apostles. Um, and we have plenty of proof from that point on that James of Jerusalem, James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, was very influential as a pastor in the early church. He developed a lot of the doctrine that they were teaching through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was involved in a lot of what Paul did in Acts 12 and 15. So the book of James is a letter fairly similar to Paul's epistles. It seemed like they probably were friends. They seemed to be writing similar things around the same times, trying to encourage people in similar ways. Now, James wrote in a different way to Paul's letters. He didn't write to a single church about a single issue. He wrote in the beginning of this, we see, to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Now, there's some debate about what he's talking about, whether it's to all Jewish people that were dispersed um, or whether it was to believers. If you read the context, it's pretty quick to assume that he's writing to Jewish believers who are dispersed throughout the, the Roman nations. Um, the dispersion is a proper term referring to those 12 tribes, but it can be easily seen to be believing Jews as well. So it's a unique statement. It doesn't talk about a particular church. It doesn't talk about just a single issue that one church is going through like we might see in 1 Corinthians or in other passages that Paul's dealing with a specific issue. But he's going to be dealing with a lot of the general issues that the churches at the time were going through. Um, he's going to be talking as we go through the book about people who are poor, and how they should be handled in the church, people who are poor and how they should treat the rich people in the church, about not showing favoritism to the rich or the poor in the church. We're going to see a lot of things having to do with that as we go through. But he starts the book and kind of ends it with bookends talking about trials, talking about the trials that they're going through in their daily lives. They're a reoccurring theme. They're th something that's going to come up today and it's important to us as modern Christians, because that's a reoccurring theme to us, right? Now, we probably have something specific in our minds when I say going through trials. Most of us at any given time are dealing with something difficult, right? Most of us have something on our minds. If it's not something relating to us, it might be something dealing with another believer in our church, a friend of ours or a family member who has constant health issues or is having work issues or something like that. Now, in James 1... We're going to look, like I said, to see how, we can, how when we experience trials, the Lord uses it to form us into a completed follower of Christ. 
I use the word completed intentionally, not a complete follower, just because of the way our language is. I don't want you to think I'm telling you that you're only a partial believer when you first get saved. You are completely a believer. You put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. You have repented of your sins. You have made the steps that we as humans have to do to follow Christ, to put our faith in him, accept his free gift of salvation. That's it. You're a believer. But what I'm saying is completed, or as we have in our translations, often perfect. Um, It might say in yours something different, but um, I'm sorry, I lost my verse here. Oh, I'm sorry, in verse 4. <laughs> and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. That idea of being complete is being an effective servant for Christ, an effective tool in the work for Jesus. Now, I'm going to be careful to try to say completed just for that purpose. Um, it's, it's going to be a theme throughout James of that idea of God uses our circumstances to make us more and of effective tool, more completed, more perfect. And again, we're not talking about perfect as without sin, but we're talking about perfect in the situation as a better tool for his service. Now, the first point that James makes for us is that we are to rejoice in trials. We're talking about how we should be viewing trials. We should rejoice in trials. Now, trials or as he says, various trials, like I've talked about, could be many different things. It could be a situation at work where you're being persecuted for your faith or you're being passed over because someone else has some other reason that the boss chooses them over you for no real fault of your own. It could be health issues. I know of a lot of health issues in our church. It's a constant thing of prayer for our church. We have a lot of people who are struggling with serious issues and know that we are praying for you. Our prayer prompters are a constant encouragement, a reminder for that. If you are going through health trials, know that we are praying for you, and I hope that brings you encouragement. But Paul, or James here is going to talk about what those trials are for. He's saying that they should be used to help us to rejoice. Most of us have an idea in our life of what we would like life to look like. I'm guessing most of you probably have an ideal idea where you don't have a lot of problems. Most of you probably aren't like, oh, Maybe today I'll have a new health issue so I can rejoice in Jesus better. (laughs) Most of us have an idea that we would like things to go smoothly, that fits into our plans, that everything's going to go as we want. We're going to get this job that we would like, or we're going to complete school without any hitches or problems. We're going to get the degree we want, have the perfect job, have the perfect house, have the perfect life. But that's not the way our world works. There is sin, there is corruption in the world, there is disease, there is illness, there is car accidents, financial problems, all those things that happen in life. We all have our own struggles. We know that things won't be ideal and perfect. Those of us that have illness now or difficulties with families, financial problems, housing troubles, issues with neighbors, persecution for your faith, any number of things, it probably is easy to say, oh, I wish this would all go away and I could have an easy life. Now, we're not going to try to make a comprehensive answer to all of the trials in life. We're not going to say, oh, if you're feeling this, you should do this. But James is telling us that we need to rejoice in these things, and he's going to explain to us why. A trait of a mature believer is an understanding that God uses our circumstances to make us more like Jesus. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the idea of the health and wealth gospel. It's a pretty common thing in our country that preachers teach that if you believe in Christ, if you have true faith in Jesus, everything's going to be great. You're going to have the job you want, the car you want, the house you want, all those things. You're going to be happy. You're going to be healthy. But most of you will look at Scripture and see that that's not consistent. We are not promised to have an easy, smooth life. We are promised difficulties. We're promised trials. If you look at the men who wrote Scripture, look at the apostles, Most of them died in martyrdom or in prison. They are not easy lives that God has called us to. It doesn't fit with our observations of life. It doesn't fit with the Bible. James tells us to count it all joy when we go through various trials or 
Another way to look at it would be count it as great joy. That might be what your translation says. When we experience trials, we're supposed to be joyful about it. It doesn't mean we flippantly shrug it off and just smile and go about our business. It means that we're made stronger as Christians through those trials. Like an athlete who's exercising his body, trials are the things we go through to make us better. So an athlete who wants to become a better athlete doesn't just wake up one day and become a better runner. They have to put in the work, right? They run, they lift weights. They go through the exercise to make themselves stronger. The more rigorous the strain, the more it tears down their body and the more strongly it builds up later. Paul says in Romans 5, verses 3 through 4, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Or in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, it says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. James says in verse 3 that the testing of our faith provides steadfastness. The testing that he's referring to is not like a test at school, not like a quiz of your knowledge. It's testing is another word for... um, is another word used in the New Testament like we referred to in 1 Peter 1 where it's talking about the refining of gold. The word literally is translated proven genuineness. Steadfastness is proven genuineness. Or I'm sorry, testing is proven genuineness. It's that idea of they take a metal, melt it down to its molten state to remove its impurities, and then when it's hardened, it is a more pure, a more pure version of what it was before. That is the testing that we undergo in Christian life. When we go through difficulties, when we go through these trials, it's God using the fire of our life to refine us, to make us better tools for him. We should rejoice and endure in this, and and in it will produce us steadfastness. Other words for that are perseverance, or the literal translation of remaining under. So, That idea of remaining under is to be consistently under that strain, to be consistently um, being forced to grow. James here is telling us that only under the stress of these trials will we be strengthened to endure this difficulty. Now, you might have heard of a New Testament writer. His name is N.T. Wright. He likes to clarify this idea by saying um, it's a similar idea to patience. Patience is what believers are to exercise toward people, and endurance is what we are to exercise toward problems. He says, Endurance is what faith, hope, and love bring to an apparently impossible situation. Patience is what they show to an apparently impossible person. So when we have to have patience with a difficult person, we need to have endurance through a difficult trial. We're called by James to rejoice in this growth. As servants of God, we're genuinely to seek to be faithful and fruitful servants, to become a better servant. We're not supposed to sit around and just try to, you know, survive life. We're to grow, to be more Christ-like so that we can be a better servant of God. Trials enable us to do that. Just like if you were a mechanic or anyone else, you would not want a tool with impurities. You wouldn't want a wrench that has a bad handle that's going to break and possibly injure you. In the same way, We don't want to be a tool with a flaw in the work for Jesus. We want to be faithful tools for his service. Now, James, as we go on in this text, if you just read it at face value as you read through it, it might be difficult to kind of see the way he jumps. Sometimes in our New Testament epistles, we get used to the way Paul writes. Now, every writer has a different style, we know, in our modern day. It's the same in New Testament writing or in the Old Testament. Everybody has a different way they wrote. Now, Paul is very ordered and systematic. Usually, you could tell very clearly when he changed subjects. Sometimes, reading James, it can be a little bit jumpy. It kind of bounces around a little bit. He's going to talk about suffering here, and then he's going to talk about praying, and then he's going to talk about sin, and then he's going to talk about suffering. So it can be easy to be like, oh, he's just changing the subject. We're talking about something else now. 
But all of these points actually point back to his main point about trials. So we're going to look next. Um, the next point is that we are to pray in our trials. We're to pray when we're experiencing these trials. At the end of verse 4, James says that through our trials, through the crucible of refinement, refinement we're to become complete, lacking in nothing. He next discusses the practical side of this. Okay, what does that look like? What do we do? He begins in verse 5 by saying, okay, if you're incomplete, if you're lacking wisdom, ask God for it. Pray for it. That's what you're supposed to do next. So as we read verse 5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. So often, our reaction to trials might be, one, to look for a solution, to try to solve it ourselves. It might be, okay, well, what can I do to, what are my resources to make this problem go away? I'm not saying that's not how God's going to use it in your life. If you have a broken car, it's very likely that a mechanic can help you with that. But there are going to be times where there's just no visible solution for our problems. God is what we need to seek, the one we need to seek to help us with those issues. And it's interesting that he doesn't say, pray to the Lord for resources or pray to the Lord for money to solve your problem or for a medical cure to solve your illness. He says, pray for wisdom. Because wisdom is an understanding of God. We talk about wisdom in our normal daily lives as knowledge in practice, right? You, anybody can learn how to fix a car from a book, but until they actually do it hands-on and see how that works, they don't have the wisdom to actually do it. That's a pretty crude example of what we consider wisdom, but biblical wisdom is different. Biblical wisdom is an understanding of God's perspective, If we're going through a trial, we don't understand what for. We should ask God for wisdom and he'll give us that understanding. He'll he'll tell us or show us how it can be used to make us a better servant of him, to be more effective in his service. Now this growth is what we're talking about. This growth through trials, godly growth, is what we're looking for. This is the joy we should be taking in it. We should be enjoying the fact that God is making us more like him through it. Another thing about this passage is that it's important in helping us understand prayer. This is one of the very clear passages in the New Testament that talks about prayer. It says, When you ask for God, the God who gives generously without reproach, it will be given to you as God sees fit. Obviously, as God decides and desires for that to be, his will will be done through prayer. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea and is driven and tossed by the wind. Prayer is not just communication with the world or the universe or anything else. It's talking directly, an intimate one-to-one conversation with the creator of the universe. It says he gives generously. God, as the creator of the universe, not only created the world we lived in, he created existence. We're talking about pastor here in Genesis chapter 3 recently, but he talked about creation. We often think that God created all the things, all the earth, all the animals, all the plants, all the people, and he did. That's completely accurate. But God created existence. God created time. Before God created time, there was no time. There was no tomorrow. There was no yesterday. There was just nothing without God. God created all things, and for us, To think when we pray that God can't provide what we really need is wrong. We're not praying in the right way. We have to pray with faith. I have a friend who's a pastor of a small church. He started going through a program um, that helps their small church grow. The idea is to help you encourage the members of your church to increase in evangelism and to increase in outreach and ways to help the church grow. Now, one of the things they have you do in the beginning um, is called Small Church USA. It's a conference. You go, you bring some people from your church with you to help learn about what the program is going to be and how to enact it. They start you praying for how many people you would like to be saved in a year. And it's kind of a test (laughs) 
they sit you down, they're like, okay, how many people do you think could get saved in your church in a year? And if you say two or three, they're going to be like, oh, I don't know if you're right for this program. <laughs> if you say a hundred, they're like, okay, let's talk. <laughs> because God can do those things. And if we are only going to pray for a small amount of things, that to them tells that maybe you're not committed to this. God can provide anything we need. God will provide what we need for his will to be done. So when we pray, we need to pray with confidence that God is the provider, is the one who can give that to us. But the important part of that that really affects our understanding of praying is faith. If we were to pray to God and not really believe that he would give what we're asking or that he could give what we're asking, then we're not genuinely praying in faith. James describes it here that a person who's, who does not ask in faith is doubting. He says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, unstable in his ways. So when you're praying through a trial, when you're praying for your friend who's dealing with a struggle, if you're not praying with faith in the God who can provide it, then you're not actually praying. You're not actually doing anything that's productive. You're not asking it of God. It's interesting how our society, removing itself from God, is trying to find ways to encourage each other without God in it, right? It became a big thing five or ten years ago on Facebook or any other social media. When someone's going through an issue, someone will say, I'm sending thoughts and prayers your way. I always thought that was so ridiculous. Or I'm sending good feelings is another good one. Where sending thoughts, I, I mean, I, I meant to say good feelings the first time. Sending prayers your way, they might be saying it in a godly way. They might be genuinely praying for them. But sending good feelings your way is another one you hear that really is just silly. It's if they don't believe in God, if they don't have faith in God, what are they praying to? What good feelings are they sending? How are those good feelings going to get transferred across the world to someone else? All it is is just words. And that's what it's like when we pray and we don't have genuine faith. We're just saying words. If we're not praying to the God who created the world, we're not praying with faith that he can help us in our trials, that we can grow closer to him through it, then we're not actually praying. Now next, James is going to tell us that in our trials we need to cling to him, to cling to God in our trials. Verses 9 through 11 are kind of another jump. It looks again like he's talking about something different. Now he's kind of bringing up something that's going to come up again in the next couple chapters, talking about the rich and the poor. There's a lot of discussion in this passage alone about whether he means poor believers, or if poor is referring to unbelievers, or maybe the rich is referring to unbelievers. If you read passages like Ecclesiastes, um, the rich are often seen to be the bad guys. They're often seen to be non-believers who always get everything they want. But in this, it seems like he's genuinely talking to believers both ways and he's encouraging them about how they need to handle this, how they need to handle their trials, their difficulties in life. Now, like we talked about earlier, it can often be uh, an easy solution in our minds to think that we can rely on our resources, that we can rely on um, money, on doctors, on the things we have that we need um, and we know that God is greater than all those things. If God wants to put you through a trial that is going to put you at a point of vulnerability where your only choice is to rely on him in faith, he can do that. He can make something beyond what your resources are. And in this, pa this part of the passage, he's going to talk to those rich and poor people alike and tell them that they need to rely on Christ. They need to be clinging to him in the trials. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Let the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises in the scorching heat, with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower fails and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuit. So the poor, he says, should exalt in the fact that they are made, they are exalt, or I'm sorry, they should boast in their exaltation. They should be grateful to the Lord that even though they are the lowest in society, in Roman society, poor people were less than slaves because slaves at least worked for someone important. 
Poor people who had no resources, had no money, were looked down upon in every way. But they should boast in their exaltation. They should boast in Jesus because he's the reason they have a purpose. He's the hope that they have. The rich should boast in their humiliation. That's kind of a tricky one. That's a little harder. That's why some people think this might be talking about people who are not believers because God doesn't want us to be humiliated. He's talking in this passage about growing, becoming more Christ-like. But what he's talking about is people look at your trials from the outside. They see that you're going through a hard time and we know that it's not uncommon to look at others and judge them based on the trials they're going through, probably because we've done it ourselves. It's easy to see someone and be like, oh man, they're always going through so much. I wonder if they're living in sin. Or I wonder if they're just really bad at raising kids because all their kids, their kids are a mess. It can be easy to judge people based on their circumstances. On our small group on Sunday nights, um, we've taken a break for the summer now, but we've been working through Job. And all of Job's friends that initially do such a good job, they come and they console him. They sit with him for seven days in the ashes of his life and they weep with him. That's a good friend, right? But then they go and they tear down everything he does, everything he says, and they're like, oh, you must be the worst sinner alive because all this stuff has happened to you. But instead of allowing people to to ruin our perspective of what our trials are, we should remember, we should boast in the fact that God is using something. He's working in our lives. He's making us more Christ-like in that trial. So then we're going to move to verse 12 here. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now this is another jump. We're going to change the subjects a little bit again. He brings up trials again here in verse 12, and then he's going to start talking about testing. Or I'm sorry, about temptation. Now the root word that's used for trials and temptation is actually very similar. Um, so some people, including the translators of the ESV, in um, verse 13, like to see it a little bit differently. We, we use that word tempted right away. Um, some translations will use it as tested in the beginning of verse 13. But the idea is when in verse 12 we're talking about testing, we're now talking about the temptation that often comes with that. The reason why they use that word tempting in verse 13 is because every test has a temptation, right? Every time we have something bad go wrong, there's some temptation to make it either someone else's fault, make it God's fault, make it something other than what it is. We can blame God for the situation we have. We can be angry at God because of what happened to us. That is giving in to the temptation to sin. Now, Paul or J James here, is going to talk to us about what temptation is. He says, when each person, or I'm sorry, in verse 13, he says, let no one say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot tempt with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So God is the one who brings us trials, but he is not the one who leads us to sin, the one who leads us to blame, who leads us to wander away from God because of our difficulties. It's an important distinction. This idea of being drawn away is like the idea of fishing. That you may like to fish with live bait. You put a worm in the water and it's tempting to the fish. They see it. They want to eat it. They grab it and then you draw them away. You pull them away from where they're supposed to be. James makes an important point for us here that when we allow that sin to become the purpose of our trial, we're not gaining anything from it. We're not growing closer to Christ. We're not increasing in joy in our difficult situation. This has been called the fool's biography. Just a short, catchy name for what James is saying here. Um, in verse 15, when desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the steps of what's called the fool's biography is broken down into the cycle of sin in a person's life. First there's temptation, then there's sin conceived, 
then sin given birth to, then sin maturing, and then death. We're drawn toward the sin like fish drawn toward the bait, like that analogy brings. Without the atoning work of, our, of Christ in our lives, our sins would lead to eternal death, eternal suffering in hell. Only through faith in Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, as 1 John 1, 9 tells us, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins, forgive us from all our unrighteousness, cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So without the saving work of Christ, our sin would lead to death. And our sin, the giving into the temptation of sin and trials, ruins the, the advantage we could gain from it, the joy we can have in Christ, making us more like Him, of knowing that there's something God's using it for, a purpose. So James finishes this section then, providing contrast that sin and temptation is not from God, but blessing is. Verses 17, or 16 through 18 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Temptation is not, but good things are, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So God never changes. He's never inconsistent. He's always good. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a first fruit of his create creatures. Brothers and sisters, are you facing a trial today? Are you dealing with a difficult thing? Do you seem buried under the weight of difficulty, of circumstances, of illness, of work problems, of car problems, of all these things that seem to just bury you? Or are you in a calm part of your life right now where th seems th things seem to be going well, but you're noticing that other people are in that situation. Others are sick. Others are discouraged. It can be easy when we're in those good places to look at James chapter 1 and walk up to our friend who's sick and be like, you know, you should be more joyful. That's not what we do here. Like we talked about in Job, his friends laid in the dirt and cried with him. Sometimes that's what our friends need when they're suffering, when they're sick, when they're hurting. They need to know that we care. They need to know that we're not going to judge them for not being joyful. Another good example we have is Jesus. When he heard that Lazarus was dead, what did he do? He wept. Jesus wept. Jesus, who knows all, who knew that he was about to go and raise Lazarus from the dead, wept. Jesus knows that when people are in pain, your grief along with them can be an encouragement, it can be a help. It can be a ministry to our loved ones to hurt with them. So I encourage you, when you have a friend going through trial, don't use this and be like, You're, you should be more joyful. We need to remind them that we care, remind them with love, remind them, and as they're healing, work through them, work through this with them. Help them to see the ways that God could be using this trial to strengthen their faith, that God could be using this trial to make them more completed, to make them more like Christ. The music that we sang today was encouraging to me. And like I said, it's sometimes really neat to see how songs that have been planned all this time ago relate to what I'm preaching today. Even though I hadn't planned what I was preaching yet when these songs were decided, it is well with my soul was the last, one of the last songs we sang. It's a reminder in trials of life that we need to rely on Jesus, to put our faith in him and trust in him. And as, as the um, music team comes back, the last song we're going to be singing is Rejoice. The chorus says, With every breath he's given, praise the Lord. In the times we live in, we will praise the Lord. Throughout every season, I am sure we have every reason to praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it teaches. We thank you that you don't let us struggle for no purpose, that you don't let us go through the difficulties of life without your guiding hand. We thank you that there is a purpose for our pain, there is a purpose for our trials, that that purpose is to become more like you, Lord. We pray that you would help us in our lives to see your will, to see your guiding hand, and that we would have faith in you so that our trials would not be wasted when we sin by questioning you, by doubting you, by blaming you. We pray that we would be filled with, um, with faith in those situations. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.